Though it may seem commonplace now, the saxophone is one of the most novel instruments commonly used in solo, chamber, and large ensemble works today. At 174 years old, it is a baby when compared to instruments like the flute or trumpet, which have existed in various iterations for hundreds or thousands of years. Because of this, the saxophone does not have the same historical breadth of repertoire as these more established instruments, and has struggled to find its place in the symphony orchestra. The body of works for saxophone soloist and orchestra was non-existent until 1879 and remained incredibly limited until the beginning of the 20th century. In large part, this expansion of the repertoire came about thanks to the trailblazing efforts of one saxophonist, a woman whose contributions were somehow forgotten for decades, Elise Hall. To learn more about Hall's legacy and contributions to the saxophone repertoire, we spoke to saxophonist and scholar Dr. Paul Cohen. Dr. Cohen has done extensive research into the body of work commissioned by Hall, and has unearthed several forgotten works written for her by the American composer Charles Martin Leffler. First, some background about Elise Hall. Hall was born in Paris during the mid-19th century and spent most of her adult life in Boston. She married a wealthy doctor but became a widow in 1897. With her new financial and personal freedom, she was able to pursue music. Hall was an amateur musician who did not take up the saxophone until late in life, but she had personal and professional connections with Georges Langy of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. This connection helped her to commission works for the saxophone from some of the finest composers of her time. Her background is fascinating. Uh, as she was learning to play the saxophone, in part to help with some medical issues, uh, she was not a virtuoso player and never thought of herself as a virtuoso player. To, go, to become more involved in the musical times in her city of Boston, she became associated with the Boston Orchestral Club. In fact, she ran it for a couple of years. And that was a club of, of uh, amateurs and professionals, an orchestra that would hold concerts a few times a year, playing music they wanted to play. And they weren't at the level of the Boston Symphony, but they were an active group that uh, was in part coached by Georges Langy, the oboist for the Boston Symphony, shepherded by Charles Martin Leffler, who was the uh, assistant principal violinist of the symphony. And they would present concerts that would satisfy their interest in being involved musically. Elise Hall wanted to play in the orchestra. At that time, about the only thing she could play was the Bizet La Lazy and Suites, numbers one and two, which has a beautiful saxophone part in the orchestra. She wanted music that she could play as a member of the orchestra and not necessarily becoming a soloist for the orchestra. And she made that request fairly explicit in her commissions. She was interested in pieces like Prelude in the Afternoon of a Farm by Debussy, where the flute has a really great part in it, but the flute stays in the woodwind section and is featured as a soloist, but that comes out as a soloist. So we see some of these pieces are very beautiful, very lyrical, not particularly complicated, use the saxophone voice as a beautiful haunting lyrical sound throughout, but does not really take over the reins as featured solo capacity, and is usually not technical. Now, some composers totally ignored that. Uh, the Schmidt legend it's a very difficult, demanding, first-class solo concerto. But that was dedicated to her in 1918, just about the time she retired from playing, so she never had a chance to even tackle that. Uh, and some other pieces turned out to be more of a solo than she wanted, but the solo parts are not particularly difficult, so these are things that she was able to play. But it's interesting to see that her intent was not to get solo concertos written for her, but to have orchestral works that included the saxophone in a significant way and that's what she accomplished most of the time. Hall is best known for commissioning Claude Debussy's Rhapsody for Saxophone and Orchestra. Many of her other contributions to the repertoire were totally lost until more recent decades when scholars began to uncover them. Dr. Cohen's research into Elise Hall led him to rediscover a treasure trove of forgotten works. I first learned about Elise Hall when I was studying the Debussy Rhapsody as a, a young player, to have a piece by Debussy for the saxophone was amazing, and her name was at the top. So the question was, for me, 
who was this person for whom the WC was written? And why was it written? So that's how I first found out about it. And at that time, there was a little bit written about her, some from program notes from uh, uh, early performances and some from recordings. But that it led to further questions. Uh, an amateur woman saxophonist from Boston commissioned the great Debussy to write a work for her. And it's uh, an amazing work for saxophone by uh, an early impressionist composer, Debussy. That got me more interested to find out more. And in finding out more, there's an intriguing history about Elise Hall, who she was, how it is that she uh, commissioned Debussy to write this, and then to find a treasure trove of other works that were written for Elise Hall, some of which were published, some of which were never saw the light of day, some of which were forgotten, and some of which were just lying in obscurity. And so that started a real interest to find out if the Debussy wrote for her, what other treasures were written for her. So first you look at the pieces that were published that were written for her, such as the Florence Schmidt legend, and uh, maybe the piece by Grove Lay, also a well-known French composer at the turn of the century. And then you naturally start to look at what other pieces were written for her that we don't know about. And it turns out there were many, some of which were found in the, comp in the composer's estates, most of which were found out in the Elise Hall collection. When she died, in the early 1920s, she gave her materials to the New England Conservatory of Music Library. And there we found quite a number of pieces that were of interest, including uh, correspondence, including scores, parts, uh, program notes. And then sometimes we'd actually go to the composers themselves and find their materials related to these pieces. And we were able to stitch together a whole history of the legacy of Elise Hall and her contributions to not only saxophone repertoire, but to the role of women in a serious performance at the turn of the century, the turn of the last century. One of Dr. Cohen's primary research interests is uncovering lost saxophone repertoire. In the early 1980s, this interest led him to fascinating discoveries about the history of the saxophone repertoire and Elise Hall's contributions to it. In an obscure reference library, he rediscovered what is thought to be the second work ever written for saxophone and orchestra, the Divertissement Espagnol, written in 1901 by American composer Charles Martin Loeffler for Elise Hall. Dr. Cohen prepared and re-premiered this work at the Manhattan School of Music in the 1980s. This performance was the first one since 1903 by Hall herself. Shortly afterwards, Dr. Cohen's research in the New England Conservatory Elise Hall collection and in the Library of Congress led him to rediscover two different scores for a chamber work, Ballade Carnivalesque, also written by Leffler for Elise Hall. This work for flute, oboe, bassoon, alto saxophone, and piano had been played twice by Hall in 1904 and 1905, and then forgotten after her playing career ended. It is particularly notable for being the first known chamber work in which the saxophone is a musical equal to the other players, rather than a color instrument used sparingly for effect. Dr. Cohen reconciled the differences between these two scores, taking into account notes in the score from Leffler himself, and created a performance version of the piece. Cohen has since published this version of the Blood Carnivalesque, performed it several times, and has just recently recorded it on his new CD, Heard Again for the First Time. Leffler's Divertissement Espagnol and Ballade Carnivalesque are just a few of the many works that Hall commissioned over the course of her playing career. The breadth of her contributions to the repertoire is significant. We have the recordings of her playing. So her main legacy is in the pieces that exist because of her. If it was only for the Debussy, 
we'd be happy. But there are more than just the WC. Significant works include the Schmidt legend, uh, include the Leffler, Ballad Carnivalesque, the chamber work. We have other pieces by lesser known composers that may be substantial and should be looked at. Uh, music by Andre Caplet, uh, Grovele, G R O V L E Z, are some composers that come to mind. Paul Gilson was a very, very famous Belgian composer who wrote a work that was dedicated to Miss Hall. There are also a number of chamber works by Dupin and by Willett, composers of the time who had some prominence, also by Georges Langy, who was an oboist and a composer. Also, I forgot the uh, the Choral Verrier by Vincent Dandy, D-I-N-D-Y. That's a very beautiful work. And we have a list of about 24, 25 pieces uh, that are a fascinating window or insight into how composers would look at the saxophone at the time. Some of the pieces are really terrific. Some of the pieces are rather slight. All of them are fascinating and all of them give great insight as to how they thought of the saxophone. This extensive collection of early concert works for the saxophone is an artistic marvel, which ought to have been performed and celebrated by saxophonists and concertgoers alike. Yet, nearly all of the works commissioned by Elise Hall were forgotten for the better part of a century. How could this be? In part, this can be attributed to Hall's career and legacy itself as well as to the musical tides of the time. She was not a teacher, and she had no intention of being a teacher. She was a player, a player who wanted to play with her friends in the orchestral club so that she could enjoy the expression of performance music. So she had no, no students, uh, probably would not have accepted them if they had asked her. And, and she didn't have a need to teach, and she did not have a need to play in any kind of commercial venue being hired to play. She just wanted to play. And so, uh, and so that's another reason there was no legacy for her, because there was no legacy for her. When she passed away, everything just stopped. There was nobody picking up the mantle for that. And at that point, the idea of the classical saxophone uh, was still relatively new and, un and untested. Yes, there was a lot of use of the saxophone in opera, orchestras, and ballet, both in Europe and more and more in this country. Um, and right around the time that she passed away, jazz was only beginning to become more popular. It hadn't solidified yet, and the saxophone was not an integral part of jazz as it quickly became. But the idea of having a solo saxophone recital, for instance, was still somewhat novel. It wasn't until the early 20s when Joshua Gurich and Rudy Weedoff you know, tested the waters by holding their own recitals of just the saxophone as a, as a soloist. Uh, and playing not the popular music of the day, but a variety of other musics, some original, some orchestral uh, transcriptions adapted for the saxophone and piano, uh, and then some novelty tunes. So there was really no place for this to be picked up at the time. Though her legacy may have been lost for some time, there is no doubt that Hall was a trailblazer, both as a saxophonist and as a woman in music. She defied expectations of, and limitations on, women's participation in musical life. We don't really come across anything that inhibited her career because of her gender. I haven't seen anything from where she wanted to be as a player, her gender getting in the way. She was in charge of the orchestra club. She funded everything. She had uh, many composers writing for her and she had ample opportunities to do all the playing she wanted to do. She didn't record because she didn't want to. She didn't really play outside of her, of her area of Boston because she didn't want to. Uh, and from what I can tell, there was no real impediment to her as a woman. As a woman, Hall operated with uncommon agency in the musical world. It is worth noting that her circumstances were unique. A single woman with significant financial resources and high social status. This may have opened doors for her that were closed to other women, and certainly helped facilitate her commissions. However, other women saxophonists also had thriving performance careers during this era. But I'm not surprised about that, because at the early part of the, of the 1900s, women were very actively involved in music making on the saxophone. I have a, a, a postcard from 1904 showing the Schuster sisters from St. Louis, an all-female saxophone quartet. Charles Lefebvre, the great Paganini of the saxophone of the 19th century, after he uh, retired from the Gilmore and Sousa band, started up his own female saxophone quartet, 
of which she was the one non-female, and he toured with them all over the country, including Alaska, if not the world, women doing that. We have uh, the first recorded saxophone from the 1880s, early 1890s, was Bessie Mecklin's. She had a very active professional duo with harp and saxophone that uh, played all over the Northeast for decades. Uh, and there were many other instances of women being involved in professional saxophone playing for a period of time. Thanks to today's researchers, we are rediscovering the contributions of women to the development of our musical traditions. These women may finally receive long overdue recognition for their work. In the case of Elise Hall, we have rediscovered the contributions of a saxophonist whose musical impact places her among the greatest figures of the instrument. The value of her commissions cannot be overstated. The legacy of our instrument is solely a function of the music written for it. Performers come and go. They do leave some, some, some leave a recorded legacy, which we can understand from, but when everything else stops, what music exists for the instrument and what impact does that have on us? So when we look at the thousands and thousands of saxophonists who have prospered, even in the country field, over the past 150, 200 years, 150 years, we come up with a very few who've had an impact. Charles uh, Edward Lefebvre from the 19th century, the Paganini of the saxophone, who was born in Europe but came to this country in the 1870s, and who really helped to uh, spark the saxophone in the United States, is one of those people. For him, the Florio Quartet and the uh, introduction theme and variations, the concerto, were written for him. And those are significant works as the beginnings of our repertoire. And then we have Elise Hall. And then we have Rudy Weedoff. And then we have Sigurd Rascher. Cecil Leeson. Marcel Mule. And then we stop. So we have of five or six major players for the legacy of her instrument. Elise Hall is one of them because of the music that she had written for her and because of the time that she had it written for. She has that importance in the pantheon of important saxophonists. Mm -hmm.